Hey there, y'all. Welcome hey. to Real Women Real Talk. We are back and we have grown. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all just don't understand. We are about to have some real sister time right now. Uh, welcome to another episode of Real Women Real Talk, where we are creating a safe space virtually, giving you a sneak peek in to what it's like being in a Real Women Rock sister circle. I am Trinace Richardson, and I am the founder of Real Women, and I'm joined by my co-host. I am the fantabulous Siobhan Carter, and I'm a facilitator for Real Women. Yes, fam, you. I see you. Uh -huh. you. Uh -huh. I see you. I see you. And I, we would like to formally introduce um, our, you know, there is nothing thicker than sisterhood blood. I just don't believe that there's anything thicker in my life. Sisterhood blood is thicker than all of it. So, because <laughs> your family is your family and you love them, but you don't get to choose them. You get to choose your sisters. And so... Um, we are over the moon excited to introduce to you all, and I mean, really just reminding some of you, because if you are connected to real women in any way, you have experienced um, the awesomeness that is Nefertiria McBride. She yeah. is um, an executive level uh, in, um, in her own field, and she gets to share if she wants what all of that looks like. But she is also moving into the space of which she has always been a coach and a counselor and a mentor to women, but she is formally training. If you all have been listening to our episodes, you know that Siobhan is on that journey as well. So um, she is formally uh, being trained to be a licensed therapist and, um, and she is a lead facilitator for real women. Um, she is an author. She is a mom and a grandmom. Um, she is partnered booed up. She has um, amazing accolades and accomplishments. She's um, a licensed minister. Um, she is all the things and we are just um, so elated to have her. Now that was some of her rundown of her roles and all of that, <laughs> that she be doing. But Siobhan and I like to just tell y'all when we have a guest, like what they mean, who they are to us. And so um, I'm a, I'm gonna let you go first, Siobhan, and then I'm gonna go. Oh my God, Nef, Nefa, oh Tasha. <laughs> you are this holy. is my sister. This is my confidant. My, I don't know. I don't even know all the words that I could come up with to describe who she is. I have known Nef for over twenty years. We work together. I think I followed her probably to <laughs> the job that we work at now. Um, and just we have been in sistership for a long time, shared a lot together, um, and so thankful that we're still journeying together, even in this counseling space and pursuing um, our degree and licensure. So I'm just so excited to have you, sister, on with us today. Thank you, thank you. And you're gonna get to say hello in a minute. Just wait, sit there for a second, soak it all in. Um, and so these two women were probably introduced to me for real, for real around the same time because they came to real women around the same time. Um, and I have come evolved, it has evolved to um, them being participants in the sister circles to being go-tos, to be substitute facilitators in the sister circles. Yeah, I remember those days. Yeah. Um, to actually being facilitators and then leading the facilitators and training the facilitators. Um, I'll just, I'm just going to be so transparent. This is going to be a different episode. I already feel it because there was a period and a point when I thought, life was not going to allow me to continue to lead real women the way that I was. Um, I would always be a part of it, but not lead it. And I was just going to say here <laughs> to my baby, to these two women, just because um, I just, I trust these women. I trust Nefertiria. She is a confidant and a counselor to me already. 
Um, and um, she has taken risks both to pour into my life and to throw me lifelines. And I am just so grateful. There are so many things we could say about you, sister, um, but welcome formally to the Real <laughs> Women Real Talk podcast. You want to say hello? Hello, everyone. And first of all, they're trying to take me out already. Y'all don't want to cry, baby. <laughs> We're trying to together. We're right here. It's okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for the invite. I'm so honored to be here to chat with you all today. So yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited. I'm really excited. We are excited to have you. And so since we're here, you know, y'all going to hear a whole lot about a whole lot of things related to real women. We're going to share those with you um, as we go through the podcast um, and we'll tell you the topic in a minute. But our first segment is always real talk. And so we just check in and we're going to start with you. Guest, not guest. Never. <laughs> How are you doing? Tell us what's been going on in your world. How are you really doing? I am really doing well. Okay. Um, I feel like some days I'm stretched thin because I'm working full time. I'm in the graduate program. I have internship, counseling internship. I have two sites within the internship. So I feel like I'm stretched thin some days, but at the same time, like I'm I'm doing well. I'm doing Good. well. Y'all are doing um double duty in a lot of different ways. I mean, double, triple duty, it feels like. So I'm, I'm really, um, and I, I'm admiring how this focused season for you, you really just grinding it out to get it all done. So that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. How you doing? Uh, oh, no, you done? I got, I got you got yeah. some more. Listen, cause I was like, is she done? Like, is you finished or is you done? Okay. Go ahead. I, I want to share that this week, in fact, uh, today, earlier today, I went to a Buddhist meeting. Wow. I did. I did. I okay. Was raised in the church, uh, father, pastor, mama, minister, um, mm -hmm. all the things deeply rooted in the church uh, from a Christian perspective, licensed minister. But I have questions and I'm curious and I'm just in a season of just being open and learning new things. Um, and I have been fortunate to be introduced with um, to someone who is a practicing Buddhist. Mm -hmm. And this individual invited me to a meeting today and it was a beautiful experience, just a beautiful experience to watch them open up and chant, which is our equivalent of prayer and the lesson um, which applies to all of us, just learning to adjust and let things go. Um, mm -hmm. And they were so welcoming and it was beautiful. It was non-judgmental. They didn't ask me what religion I am, where are you from? They welcomed me in. They asked me if I had questions. I'm, yeah, it was an enlightening, beautiful experience today. Did they try to convert you at the end? And, and no, all, they all, did not. All. They just said, Do you have any questions? Um, they just wanted to make sure that I was clear on what they were doing, why they were doing it, things of that nature. They offered me cake and ice cake and cookies, and I left out. So it was just, oh, wow. is this different? But it just felt so nice to be in a space where it was open and welcoming and there was no judgment. Mm. That was so I cool. That. I love that. Yeah. That is so cool. I know some at some point in you all's um, counseling journey, you had to visit places that were different, right? Yeah, cultural immersion um, uh -huh. in our multicultural counseling class, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what did you do when you did that, Siobhan? I I'm trying to remember. I went to um, a mosque. I went uh -huh. to a Muslim service and, and it was different. Yeah. 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 Do you remember what you did during that class, Nafateri? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, I focused on Muslim too. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't able to go to a mosque because when I took the particular class, like we were in the thick of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so I did mostly interviews. 
Got um, you. And I interviewed one of our real women sisters, uh, Sunny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Sunny. Yes. She was a support in that. I, I asked that because based on what you just shared about your journey today and then um, your journey in your program, um, I've shared on this podcast before that I'm not just, um, I don't just respect other religions, but I, I have had the opportunity to teach about other religions. I, um, mm -hmm. I'm a professor and am certified to teach a world religions class. And so um, I, it sounds like on some level, even if at a very elementary stage, we have been introduced to other faiths and um, religious traditions. And it's so amazing to see the threads, the common threads that many of us are afraid to admit exist, <laughs> but there are common threads. So, yeah. so glad you shared. I yeah. can already feel like we are going to be in for a whole nother couple of episodes. We're going to have to just bring you back. This is not going to yeah. happen in one episode because that could be a whole nother conversation yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so good um yeah. okay so i still want to stay at real talk how about that was just how we doing how about that and you was the only one that went so um this is gonna i'm telling you this is gonna be something else um siobhan how are you doing Yes. So, you know, I'm going to talk about my shirt in a few minutes, but I understand how children pout when they don't want to do their homework. Mm. That's how I'm going. <laughs> I just want to lay down and watch football. I don't want to do my homework. Listen, listen, <laughs> I understand. I understand. I'm so over school. So that's how I'm y'all sound like my 15 year old right now. Yes, and I get him. I so relate because it's just, it requires an extra bit of pushing and energy and maturity because I want to be a little kid right now and pout and fold my arms and kick and scream and cry. Um, but I can't do that because I have stuff to do and I have <laughs> to present next weekend. So that's how I'm doing. I'm pouting, but I'm pushing through it. Um, and at the time of this airing, uh, I will be nearing my FAMU, Florida A&M University homecoming that is coming up this weekend at the time of this taping or at the time of this recording this weekend. So I'm really excited because I'm going back and I'm going to be dancing and I still so I'm looking forward to just reconnecting with my dance sisters and just having a little fun. Um, we'll see how sore I am after all of this is over because I still haven't practiced the thing. But, you know, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> but that's Procrastination is in our blood. You will do it's fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. We'll do fine. <laughs> well, good. We're good. So glad to hear you are well. And um, pouting is, is also your right. You get to pout. <laughs> privilege um mm -hmm. i am doing well i am um, just getting back from speaking and it's so funny because a couple of episodes ago i was honest about um how i felt like one piece of it went really well but another piece of it of me speaking did not go well yeah and um this past weekend's um time went really well nice. um and i gauged that all, how it by how it's received, but also by how I feel about what I shared, mm -hmm. um, and whether I feel like I I conveyed and relayed everything I you know was feeling inside of me, and it has just solidified for me how my sweet spot or my zone of genius is these sister circles or these gatherings where we just get to talk it out or. Yeah. Um, or or demonstrate it out, you know, where there's some action connected to it, um, mm -hmm. and and someone is not just listening to me, but we get mm -hmm. to engage in each with each other. So um, it's solidified for me every single time that this is because that's what's um, what do we call ease and flow? That's yeah. where where I'm in ease and flow. So yeah. that matters to me. So I'm doing well. I'm doing okay. well. This week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess now we're done with the, with the yeah. question. <laughs> we, 
we're going to be here for a minute. I'm going to try not to make this two hours. Okay. So um, I did want to ask before we get into our topic, um, we are moving really close to our intensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you all have been with us for any episodes, you know that our Real Women Intensive is coming up November 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And at the time that this airs, we are probably in a space where um, the rooms, the hotel rooms, you're going to have to reach out to us, uh, Real Women, if you want a hotel room at the rate, because they're gone at the hotel. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to reach out to us. But it's still time. There is still time for you to register. And you've heard it from um, Siobhan and I about what you can expect at the intensive. Um, but we told you we would bring at least a couple of folks to you who would share with you a little bit more from their perspective. And not only has Nefertiria been uh, an attendee, uh, but she's also been a facilitator and been on the team for years. And so we, we just wanted you to share, if you could, what can people expect if they come what can women expect if they come to the intensive in November? Mm. <laughs> I know we often use the, the motto or the slogan that it's a sister circle on steroids. Mm -hmm. and, and it really is. Um, it is where we go deeper than we normally go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would just couch it as like, it's a deeper level of soul work, not mm -hmm. only a deeper level of soul work, but it's, it's a beautiful time where you get to connect with sisters, sisters that you may know, sisters that you may not know. You meet new sisters, make new sisters. Mm -hmm. um, we also, you know, incorporate chill time into the schedule chill time where you can just sit and reflect and then we have fun so you're doing soul work you get to chill out you eat good food um and then we have fun you get to dance and laugh and do all the things so for me it is like it to an annual retreat where i just get to go and be neff mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. It is it is beyond me being the audit director in my nine to five job. It is not me being mom or grandma. It is it is not me being counselor in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, I get to be me authentically in that space and just share great space with sisters. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so y'all don't have to just take our word for it. One more question. And you might have to think about this a little bit, Neff, but um, if you had to look back and say maybe your favorite moment or even your favorite intensive, um, maybe something that still today sticks with you from an intensive, either the, the whole moment um, from that year or something specific that happened. Does anything come up for you when you think about that? Oh, Lord. Um, the first thought that honestly popped up. I wouldn't necessarily say it was a favorite moment, mm. but it was a necessary moment. Mm. Um, and this is real talk, real women, Show is. all the things. So it was the year that I had been sexually assaulted by a man who was supposed to love me. Mm -hmm. So I just remember thinking that I was okay and I had started therapy and thinking that I was okay, but some way, somehow I ended up on the floor mm -hmm. during that particular um, intensive and it was a moment of healing that I needed and how my sister surrounded me and cared for me in that moment was not my favorite moment, but it was necessary. And it was one of the most beautiful moments um, that I can say that I remember from the intensive where I was allowed to be the strong one that I normally am, but I was allowed to fall apart in that moment and was, oh, I feel tears. Mm. And I was not judged in that room. Mm. That even though I am a warrior and all of the strong things that in that space, I was allowed to break and mm -hmm. fall apart and really start the healing journey that I needed. Wow. Yeah. Child. Child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah that's that's yeah. my moment. Yeah. That, that yeah. came up for me. Yeah. That's wow. powerful. Powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I want to um, 
that is going to be a place that we can come back to in mm -hmm. just a moment as we get into the topic. But I'm just going to flow the yeah. way that um, I feel it. And so um, I want you to think about one of those type of moments for you, Siobhan, while I um, kind of recall mm -hmm. one for me. If there's one that you wouldn't necessarily call it, you know, the the highlight or the, you know, the most favorite in a likable way, but it was powerful and meaningful for you. Um, and I, I just have to say, when I think about the intensives and I realize that I'm sitting there in an intensive surrounded by women, some of whom I know really well, but some I'm meeting for the first time, some I've never met um, or, or haven't spent a lot of time with because they've been in circles in other places. But we are all coming together in that moment, not because we go to the same church, not because um, we live in the same area, not because we've been doing life together all year long and have decided to take a little trip together, but because we have all agreed we're going to come together for this weekend and just kind of lay ourselves bare. And I think if I had to choose one for me, um, one of the most meaningful ones, <laughs> oh God, um, Ashley, our sister, Ashley Gilbert made us break bricks or, or <laughs> she like made us step on um, these bricks, but they were paper, but but they were not. Um, and just some things that have fallen away from year to year for me. Um, when I think about those kind of symbolic moments, I'm stepping on the thing and just falling apart as a result of what that meant and looked like for me. Um, and then uh, for even facilitating a moment where we created mosaics, which has become mm -hmm. um, a theme in my life that we work together at tables to put together these broken pieces to create a beautiful something that we were all able to leave with. Um, and just how my life has been, you know, slightly broken pieces all coming together to make something beautiful. So those are the two that come up for me right now. Um, anything you can think of, Siobhan? <laughs> yes. So I believe, I believe it was uh, one the theme was real women are out of this world, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And usually we have uh, real women uh, facilitators who are a part of real women. But this year we had uh, some different facilitators that we had not been exposed to. So me and another sister, we were a little hesitant, you know, weren't really open. <laughs> at first. Try not to laugh out loud because this was good. You know, right. So uh, just a little reserved and, and just kind of side eyeing and just seeing where it goes because we're just used to certain people. So uh, one of the facilitators got up and it was so impactful what and I can't even remember which one it was, but it was so impactful that I went from side eyeing the facilitator to being on the floor, like uh, Neff was saying, and just being on the floor crying because it was really speaking to uh, my daddy issues that I had. and so. I just remember that one just being so close minded at first and then just being so open to the point where I was just crying uncontrollably on the floor. So that's to me and, and being surrounded by sisters and just being able to have a moment where I could just release. Um, and, and that's the type of experiences that we have at Real Women. You just never know what, what's going to happen. You yeah. never know. You never know. Well, thank you all for sharing that. And um, shout out to Reverend Sabrina Mangrum. She okay. was uh, is that. one of my spiritual mentors and she yeah. was there. And I think the thing is, you know, not only do we all do things differently when we facilitate or present in front of people, um, we do have formulas that we abide by in Real Women that helps people connect and relate. And those speakers that year all came in their own way as facilitators yeah. and yeah. Uh, wrecked us, <laughs> unexpectedly wrecked us. Um, yeah. So shout out to her. I, hopefully that has given you a good 10, 15 minutes of let me go on in there uh, and register <laughs> because 
it, it is to your benefit. We will dance. We will laugh. We will kiki. We will relax. We will have a good time. But your life will be changed. There will be something that you did not expect, probably, um, that will be impacted and touched in a meaningful way. And so we want you to join us. Go to realwomenrock.org forward slash intensive just to get more information. Feel free to email us if you have any questions. Um, all of that information is on that website. So thank you, Nefa, for giving us your take on the intensive. Um, we really wanted to get that from you. And you shared how meaningful it is um, to have those intensives to share very sensitive, personal, um, traumatic um, experiences that we create the safe spaces for you to reflect on those, share if you feel safe enough to do so or free enough to do so. And you just went there just now. Um, so in the time of taping this, I'm not sure exactly um, whether it's going to be in the time of airing it, but we would have just walked away from, if not still in domestic violence awareness month. And uh, whether it is a spouse or a partner, um, family member, we have um, probably all been touched in some way, shape or form um, by either personally experiencing it or knowing someone who has. And so we want to talk about it um, for just a little bit in our deep dive. And um, I'm going to touch on our, our other question in just a second, but I just want to set the tone for a little bit because both of you all are studying, practicing um, as interns and apprentices and, and then studying it um, and moving into that space, practicing literally as a therapist. And you have probably already come across some women um, in your therapy practice who have experienced this on top of the women that you have supported as mentors and coaches. Mm -hmm. on top of your own personal experiences, right? So we're going to talk about it. Um, this is not going to be easy. We, we did our best to get as many kikis out as we could beforehand because we want to take this, this very seriously. And from here, trigger warning, right? If this is not the topic that you need in your life today, um, it's probably in the, in the um, subject so that you know that this is something that we are um, we are touching on today. But if at this point, you know, this is something you don't want to move further in, we totally respect that. Um, also, if this is something you need or something that you know someone in your life needs, lean in, settle in and join the conversation with us. Yeah. So with all of that preface, um, sister, I, I'd like for you to just start wherever you like, Nefeteria. Um, just the the idea, the thought, the concept of domestic violence, how would you define it? And if you wouldn't mind weaving somewhere in there, would you consider even the sexual assault that you mentioned as domestic violence because it was a romantic partner or not? So if you could differentiate for us, what is domestic violence? What, what um, applies to that term and what may not? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the that that intro. So when when I talk about domestic violence, it really is a pattern of abusive behavior, right? It could be in a romantic relationship or it could also be familial within the family. Um, and it it most people when you think of domestic violence, they think of physical violence. They think of you hitting someone or someone being hit, slapped, punched, kicked, all of those things, but domestic violence is it's greater it's broader than that so it not only includes physical violence it includes emotional abuse um where the victim could be intimidated uh the abuser is threatening that individual it's sexual abuse um where you're being coerced or forced into sexual acts there are many people who have in the realm of domestic abuse not only been physically hit but have been raped by their intimate partner. Um, it's also psychological manipulation, um, isolating the victims, um, keeping them away from their family and friends, 
Um, we use the term gaslighting, making them think that there's something, there's something wrong with them, blaming the victim um, for if you wouldn't act like this, I wouldn't have to hit you. Right. Um, and then there is financial abuse where the abuser has some sort of economic control where they he or she may control all of the money, um, access to the account. So domestic violence includes all of that, not just physical violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, so I am just coming to the realization, very honestly, mm -hmm. that. I could put um, one of my experiences, you know, a season of experiences in the category of domestic violence because I have always, I don't know why, I'm just going to be really transparent. Um, I don't know why I put sexual assault in some other category. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what that is, but um, for me, it was the, you know, the physical assault um, in some way. Um, so I'm, I'm processing that based on your definition. And that is very helpful. I guess I'm going to ask, um, all three of us to share, have, have, ha, is it that we have experienced it based on that definition or is it that we are aware of it through either family, friends or acquaintances or clients? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm, I'm posing that to you all as I start, um, or as I continue so I, I was molested when I was young, very young, um, like before two digits um, and then into my two digit numbers um, by family members. And um, like I said, I didn't consider that domestic violence, but they were family members and um, all the things. So uh, um, that's one way. Another way is um, my father is um, is recovered and um, delivered now. <laughs> I'll put it that way. But uh, growing up, it was very difficult. I think there's a difference, and I'm going to pose this and ask you to weave it into your sharing because I I I I do believe there's a difference between disciplining your young person whether it's talking to them or a consequence, you, you know, taking their things away from them or, you know, maybe even a slap on, the, you know, a little, a little spanking of some sort um, that is very temporary and doesn't feel lasting and all of that. That's my personal conviction. I don't, you know, I don't put that on anybody, but there is a difference between that, which we did experience and, for a season of time before my mother divorced my father, what we did experience, the pulling of the ear down the steps, getting kicked down the steps, um, watching my mother experience um, domestic violence. And so I have experienced it in both instances, directly um, with sexual assault and then indirectly and directly physically. Um, that's, um, I'll put it there so that you can share. Siobhan, you? Um, for me, I grew up in a home where there was domestic violence. Um, and growing up probably from like 12 to, I until I graduated from high school, just, um, witnessing the verbal abuse um, of my former stepfather towards my mother, hearing the fights, um, seeing him breaking things. Um, I know there was physical abuse, but I didn't I didn't observe that. But I, I am aware of some instances where he was physically abusive. So just dealing with that was challenging and even having some effects on me, even as an adult, just growing up in such a traumatic environment for so long to the point where I would fear leaving my mom home by herself. I feared going to college. Um, I remember the night that I graduated from high school, I didn't even want to go to the party because I was afraid of what he would do to her because he was mad that my biological father attended my graduation. So um, I was just really scared um, about that. So I remember a lot of fear growing up. Mm -hmm. um, in the home and just having to to deal with that. And thankfully they, they got divorced and she has moved on and married um, my current stepfather, who's a great guy. Um, so 
but yeah, that was a lot. That was a lot. Um, me personally, I've never experienced physical abuse, but I do believe there were some instances with one particular person of like emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. um, just some subtle things that were said that really, um, I guess, uh, did away, just really attacked my confidence in myself. I know that for being with that person for so long, just really made me start to second guess myself and, and stuff like that. So I think there were some, some, some subtle emotional abuse there. Mm -hmm. Understood. Thank you for sharing. Nafateria, do you want to uh, expound? I have all the things, yeah. all the things. Um, one, I am a child of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Um, and as you shared, even though my father is delivered um, and recovered now, um, I saw my father beat my mother. I saw my father beat other women. Um, my, my half siblings, some of their mothers. Um, I've seen uncles beat aunts. Um, I have jumped in my mother's fights. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where that part of me um, was was born so early because you're not going to keep beating my mama's tail and I'm just supposed to sit over here on the sofa and not do anything. Um, so she, my mother was abused by my father and then um, the next relationship, my, my younger sister's father, um, she was abused in, in that relationship. I remember one day sitting and watching TV and you know, my mom can be a, a little mouthy, not an excuse, but she can be. Um, I have a vivid, remem mem vivid memory of um, my sister's father picking up the remote and throwing it and, mm -hmm. and hitting my mother in the forehead and just blood going everywhere. I've seen my mother, aunts with black eyes. Um, so, yeah, that that was my experience um, growing up. So domestic violence was very much a part of, and unfortunately, what I thought was a normal part mm -hmm. of life and relationships, because not only did I see my mother and her sister and some other aunts abused, but I was present to the fact that my grandmother had abused, that my grandfather had abused my grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, and there was some abuse in that home too. So my mother ended up doing what she saw mm -hmm. growing up. Mm -hmm. Uh huh, and and that speaks to thank you for sharing. That speaks to um, some of what I touched on a second ago that I'd love you all's thoughts on, because um, embedded within this is you know how prevalent it it is. But I'm thinking about um, how it probably wasn't even considered domestic violence in the way that we think about it right now before. Um, gen you know, a generation or two before us, because it was men had the leeway to kind of just do it unchecked. Um, and I, I'm not taking it away from the fact that women can be abusive as well. Um, we hear it a lot as it relates to men and uh, whether it was our grandmothers or our mothers. Um, and then thinking about that whole thing, like do, just real quick. Um, before I ask about how prevalent it is right now, when you think about that time period, did you all get spankings? Do you consider corporal punishment a type of violence toward young people? Or is it just the degree to which? Um, and why I'm asking because I may, I've made a decision in my life to, I think I can count on one hand and not use all my fingers how many times I've chosen to spank my son. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, I need to make sure I've tried every other way. <laughs> and in this instance, he's not going to get it um, in any other way. And it was a, a while ago so that it never had to happen again. So the goal was to do it and not have to repeat it, like you said, you know, over and over again. But I can see how that could be connected to if I get hit and you know or then i translate that to that's how i correct behavior or that's how i can you speak to that a little bit both of you oh go ahead now oh um that's a complex question for me mm -hmm. and, and i'm being honest um i was definitely spanked 
um, when when I was growing up. Um, so I think there is some level of benefit from and being disciplined in that way. Like I didn't do a lot of things that I saw other people do that mm. did not get spanked. So um, it kept me you can say maybe in the certain parameters per se, right? Um, Cause I knew if I did this, I was gonna get my butt kicked, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it becomes abusive when, when you are drawing blood or mm -hmm. leaving marks or using extension cords. And some of the things that my parents experienced and some of the things that some of these kids are still experiencing, I think it, it crosses the line and becomes abusive then. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah thank you for that so for me i think it instilled a bit of healthy fear of my mother <laughs> because um i didn't get i didn't get um disciplined a lot physically so it was the switch you go outside and get the little tree branch off not the tree branch like a little a little branch off of the tree my grandmother would use that to hit me um, my mom would use her hands. Her hands were really heavy um, and just like hit me, but it was never like a slapping or punching or anything like that. So it didn't feel abusive. And for me, I don't feel like it was. I think it was enough discipline to let me know that she is not the one to be played with and that I needed to make sure that I abided by her rules, mm -hmm. uh, which I do appreciate because, and I think I've told this story before, um, I was leaving somewhere and I didn't call her and didn't let her know. And she, when she really found me, the police were passing by and she was hitting me while the police were passing by. And so she was like, listen, I don't care. Anybody can get it. You know, so it was just she was afraid and I understood. And so it just helped me to understand, like, there are certain things that I needed to do. So it didn't feel like fear. But like Neff said, I think if it was I mean, it didn't feel like abuse. But like Neff said, if it's something where it, it is being punched in the face, being hit in the face and causing scars and just that fear to the point of um, like you are just fearful of your parents, like you don't want to do anything, like you have to walk on eggshells. Then I feel like that is probably more on the lines of abuse, but I don't feel like I was abused. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think there's, you know, there's more discussion that we could have behind that, but I, I felt the connection um, for me because there were certain things, there were certain ways I refused to discipline my children because of the way I was disciplined. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, it puts me more in the head of my father than it does my mother because my mother spanked me too, mm -hmm. but it was fewer and farther between. And I was very clear about why I was getting it <laughs> and very clear that I should not do that anymore. And so, um, so thank you for in, indulging me in that. Um, I do want to ask, though, because of that conversation with all of that, how prevalent um, is it as prevalent as we think it is now? It, it, um, it is probably more prevalent than you think it is. Wow. It's estimated that one in four women um, are victims of domestic violence and one in nine men experience domestic violence. So if it was one more woman, woman, one more woman here, mm -hmm. one of us. Mm -hmm. Essentially, so 25 percent, um, essentially. Um, and then when you talk about physical violence with an intimate partner, it's one in three women. So it's three of us here, one in three and one in four men have experienced uh, physical violence with an intimate partner. So very prevalent within the United States. Mm -hmm. So sad. Yeah. What, right. Right. Just when you think about. I, I, I want to start by saying I don't want to take anything away. I want to acknowledge and and um, and make aware that there are some women who are uh, predatory or manipulative and know what the stigma is for men. And they take advantage of that and mm -hmm. lord over and assault men. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the, the thought is, or at least, you know, the, the practice of it is they probably won't hit me back. And so I'm going to take advantage of that. And mm -hmm. if they do, then it's actually a, you know, a fist fight because, you know, but, but to have women initiate that, I'm sure that happens. And you've just given statistics um, around that. My experience has been so often with women being abused 
Um, I just think about all of the women who I have encountered, just the hundreds and hundreds of women we've encountered in real women, plus mm -hmm. those that we have in our sphere and our circles of influence and at work. And just seeing us as the professionals that we are in our spaces or, you know, the women of God that we are in our churches and the sisters that we are to some people that behind some closed doors, mm -hmm. there is a, a stripping away yeah. of our self-esteem and our worth. Um, I, it just breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to know how many of us have experienced or will experience that. And so we just want to reach out to you right now. We're going to talk about some ways that you can get some help. But if you are in there, if you are in that space, let's do that right now because I have other questions, but it's here. If, if, if a woman is in already in that space and she is experiencing that and Folks on the outside don't know how, what should she be doing? What, what could she do um, in, in her life right now to reach out um, despite all of the fear and the, the what ifs that could be going on that could keep her trapped? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing um, is to find someone safe mm -hmm. um, and reach out either to that individual or reach out to an organization for help. Um, so I have the honor of serving at the Center for Abused Persons um, in White Plains, Maryland, and the population that we serve right now is individuals who are experiencing intimate partner violence, have been sexually assaulted, um, experiencing DV or domestic violence, as we call it, right? So um, do a search for facilities or organizations within your community. But if you are in, in danger, if you are experiencing domestic violence, I want you to be sure that you delete your search history, right? Mm -hmm. Because within domestic violence, um, some individuals are monitoring telephones and monitoring emails. So you wanna make sure that you delete your search history or reach out to a girlfriend or family member and ask them to do the research for you. But the biggest thing is if you can reach out for help and go to someone who, who you consider to be safe. Mm -hmm. I, wanna, I wanna ask a question, Evan. Thank you for sharing that. Um, because it's, it's interesting the clients that, uh, that we have, um, that it, it almost seems like it sometimes mirrors what we've gone through or, or there are some instances in our past that we can connect with them on. But I've been having um, conversations with people who are uh, children who have experienced or maybe still experiencing domestic abuse, may have witnessed um, domestic abuse. What would you say would be helpful in those instances where, you know, a child may have seen her mom or her dad, you know, getting into physical altercations? How can those children get help? Yeah, I would suggest that they talk to someone at school, mm -hmm. uh, like if there is a guidance counselor or teacher that they deem to be safe or even someone in the family. Mm -hmm. and, and I hesitate on saying someone in the family for a child because as a child of domestic violence, I often got in trouble for telling, wow. right? Um, where... I, we would go to my grandmother's house or go to another family member's house. And I would say, oh, mommy and such and such were fighting last night. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's that stigma, especially within the African-American Black communities that what goes on in this house stays in this house. And I was telling and, and, and I got punished essentially for it. So I would say I want the child to, to, to not be stigmatized by that and have the courage to report it because um, mom or dad may be too afraid to say something and that child speaking to a teacher or someone that they feel that they can trust and that may be able to intervene could help uh, get some assistance for the family. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank so you. Good. Good. So mm -hmm. good, thank you for that. You mentioned um, in the Southern Maryland area, the Center for Abused Persons and so, um, definitely look them up. And I love the very practical advice you gave about um, deleting your search history um, just for your own safety as you seek out the help that you need. 
um, just finding a resource. You can see scrolling on the screen if you are watching us. If you are not watching us, um, then I'm just going to read it to you that scrolling on the screen, you could as easily as right now text HOME, H O M E, to 741 741. Again, you could text HOME, H O M E, to 741-741 to reach a trained crisis counselor through a crisis text hot, uh, hotline. Um, and it's free and it's 24 seven, just so that wherever you are, you it's global. So wherever you are, you can get connected to the help that you need. Um, so that's one easy, quick way that we can share a resource because we don't know exactly where you're calling from or watching from or uh, listening from, but uh, we want to make something available to you. So, um, so hopefully you'll take advantage of that. We are not just praying for you. We are rooting for you. Um, it is possible. It is possible for you um, to get the help that you need. And so um, please take advantage of some of the suggestions that we've had. And we know no judgment. There are some who don't see a way out, you know, who don't see no judgment. You are, you want to reach out for support. You want to reach out for non-judgmental um, um, presence. Um, we want to be here for you in real women as well. And so if you are um, connected to us virtually, meaning you can be anywhere in the world and you'd like to, to just connect with us because we are a place that you can talk about the real, real and, and not be judged for it. We'd love for you to connect with us um, by attending one of our sister circles. Um, we want you to get the professional help and the resources that you need um, for um, the, the actual problems that you're dealing with, but we can be support to you. And so feel free to list, look out for us um, at our website. Okay, so that's for uh, the woman, the person who is in it, entrenched in it as best we can share some suggestions and thoughts. What about those of us who are embarking upon relationships? Mm -hmm. um, we are dealing with people at some maybe beginning stages or mm -hmm. we are our relationships with people are deepening and we are questioning some behavior or some things that were said. How do we recognize some warning signs so that we don't go down that road? I, I hate to venture to think how many women feel guilty because they are saying, I should have seen the signs and I'll, none of that equates to it being your fault, no matter what. But if we could look at, or at the onset of a relationship and say, I'm not going to go down that road because of that. What, what would you say some of those things might be, Ness? Um, some of them I think we already touched on, like um, emotional manipulation, manipulation, right? Um, verbal abuse or just little sayings like demeaning your character or saying little things to slowly, you know, erode your confidential your confidentiality. Um, just how you feel about yourself, your self worth, your your self esteem, isolating you mm -hmm. um don't want you to be around your friends don't want you to hang out um with your family members so those are some of the things that you you can you can pay attention to early on like okay this is kind of weird he never wants me or he or she never wants me to go out or be around anybody um they're making little slick comments about my body, my size, what I look like, what I'm wearing. Um, they're trying to control everything that you do or say. So the control is a big part. So look for little signs of control and manipulation. And then someone also trying to isolate you. Mm -hmm. So good. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts before I, I, I share, Siobhan? I'm, I'm just thinking about how mm -hmm. I... I don't, I'm thinking about relationships and how I could have described some past relationships with the word controlling. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens, you know, they didn't work out or they didn't go far enough down the road, perhaps. But I'm really 
I, I can look backward and say, you know what, that that didn't feel good. So whether it ends in domestic violence or not, that emotional abuse is a part of domestic violence. And I know you said you've experienced that. So I, I guess without um, imposing too much, your thoughts, mm -hmm. but did you see some red flags once you, you know, look back um, on the, the person that you're thinking about? Yeah. So, so a couple of things that come to mind is um, doing nice things for you, but then bringing them up later on um, mm -hmm. to throw them back in your face, uh, mm -hmm. to, to use them as a, a form of manipulation for why you should be loyal to them, why you should stick beside them when they haven't um, been the nicest or kindest um, twisting words. You know, you may say something and using deflection uh, to, to push it back uh, on me as opposed to like really owning and acknowledging, you know, maybe something they had done wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, shucks, I had another one, but it, I, I just lost it. But yeah, those are some of the some of the things that that come to mind uh, for how the emotional uh, abuse could show up. Yeah. yeah. And the, and the comparisons, comparison, like making themselves uh, be better. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Throwing your past up in your face. Like if you have shared with them your previous relationship so they can set themselves apart to say, well, I did all these things for you. So I'm better than all of the other people that you've been with and kind of trying to set themselves apart uh, and, and using what you have shared with them um, to try to work in their favor, in their mm. favor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That, Go ahead that, now. that um, Siobhan shared about like the twisting of the words. Mm -hmm. um, that is such a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And you really don't recognize the lasting impact of it. And I say that because um, I, I lead a, I guess you could say a peer support group um, for women who have suffered domestic violence or sexual assault or a number of those things. And when I tell you the number of women that are still blaming themselves, mm -hmm. what happened um, to them. So you hear a lot of the blaming language. Maybe if I hadn't done this, or maybe if I had done this, or if I had seen this earlier, or if I had done this, it's very prevalent. So that that psychological, emotional manipulation yeah. can be really huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my heart is breaking because I know how real this is. And um, it's not just within the confines of an October or November when, you know, when everybody's thinking about it because it's awareness month. Some people are dealing with this every day of every week of every month. And so our heart goes out to you. When we think about our role, and I'll try to make this our, our last um, big question, when we think about um, the folks in our lives who may be experiencing this, whether we suspect it or whether we know it, um, how can friends and family be a support of help? Um, how can we help to impact in some way the lives of our friends and loved ones who are experiencing domestic violence? Yeah. I think one of the biggest things is to, to listen to them and be a safe space. Um, holding a safe space where you are non-judgmental is huge. Um, provide them information. If you can see that they um, are reluctant to discuss it, provide information on shelters or organizations such as the Center for Abused Persons um, or hotline numbers that provide resources that they could tap into, um, respect their choices. A lot of times we want to say, okay, if it was me, I would do this, this, and this. You don't know how fearful they are. You don't know what the financial situation looks like, right? Many women say because they can't afford to leave, right? Mm -hmm. So respect their choices and just be a safe space for them. Um, encourage them, again, not only to tap into resources, but to maybe speak with a professional, maybe a counselor or maybe a, a legal advocate so they can start um, discussing, okay, what are my options? And this one is really big. Help them build a safety plan. 
right? Mm-hmm. Where, and this makes me think about Reasonable Doubt, right? If, if you haven't been watching Reasonable Doubt, you should watch that on Hulu. Um, but the, the, the person who was suffering domestic violence, her, her cousin was helping her build the safety plan, right? In the event of an emergency, if I call you, this is what I want you to do. Um, come get the kids or the kids will be here. Um, help them to start moving things out slowly or um, when the abuser isn't home, help them to pack a bag and keep the bag at your house. So if they need to leave, in the middle of the night or or leave really quickly, they will have some clothes and some other um, items in a safe space. So yeah, those are some of the things um, that that we can do as friends and family members to support. And the other part is education. Educate Mm -hmm. yourself about what domestic violence really looks like. Because again, there is such a stigma sometimes in the communities. Girl, if such and such was doing that to me, I would have did this and this. You don't know what it's like to be in that situation. So educating yourself helps to build empathy. So you can really put yourself in that other person's shoes and really try to understand what they may be going through. So those are some of the things we can do. And I and I, I love those. Those are so good and so helpful um, for those who are on the outside looking in. And something that you said made me think about when you said the education piece, like really understanding what domestic violence is, what it's all about and how it impacts the woman, because there are instances where women can't leave the very first time. Like they go back because of the depths of the emotional abuse and physical abuse and so many psychological challenges that they may be having in years of experiencing the abuse. It may take them multiple times of going back and forth. And so understanding that is helpful so that they don't feel judged for going back, you know, even if they choose to do that. And just like Neff said, trying to find a safety plan or just working with them, journeying with them. But it is a journey. And sometimes, you know, it takes uh, several attempts before they can actually leave. Yeah. yeah. And you made me think of something else. Um, when a, a woman or a man has the courage to leave but then they also build up the strength to press charges. Yeah. That is a whole other experience, right? Because in defense of themselves, the Mm -hmm. abuser is going to try to destroy Mm -hmm. the victim, right? Mm -hmm. So we have people that are, are, are standing up for themselves and they are being prosecuted. Um, Individuals are trying to find dirt on them, talking Mm -hmm. to their family Mm -hmm. members, talking to people at their jobs. So, it is like I had the courage to, to stand up for myself and try to get justice for what you did to me. And now my life is being exposed and, and I'm on the stand being persecuted um, for having the courage to stand up for myself. So that's a whole other aspect. Yeah. That victim blaming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It is so layered. Yeah. Um, and so those of us who um, have made it through <laughs> to this point mm-hmm. in this episode um, and have not or are not currently experiencing domestic violence, but no others who have, not only have you given us a whole lot of ideas and resources about how we can be present, um, but I, I just want to hone in as we as we start uh, to attempt to wrap up, that non-judgmental piece mm-hmm. is just so major because in order for them to have even come to you mm-hmm. to share yeah. or for you to have been in intimate space enough to have seen something or, mm-hmm. or gotten a glimpse of something, that means you are close enough to them to be a potential safe space. Mm-hmm. For them to work through some of the things that Nefertiria just shared with us. Mm-hmm. That can all be blown up. You can become the unsafest of spaces as soon as you begin to judge, as soon mm-hmm. as we begin to judge them. So um, we can be, you know, have the best of intentions and mm-hmm. think we're empowering them. And God forbid if we, you know, the Lord don't want this for you. If we go any of those places with spiritual bypassing, just all of those things can be of detriment. So um, 
let's be yes, let's be discerning about how we support our sisters and our brothers, um, our non-binary persons in our lives who who might be experiencing abuse on some level. Mm-hmm. All right, everybody who is listening and present, take a deep breath in and let it go. Do that two more times, deep breath in and let it go slowly. And last one together, deep breath in and let it go. If you have been living um, this traumatic nightmare um, in your life presently, uh, we know we have only touched the surface of what you are currently dealing with. Um, If this is a part of your past, you know this better than, than any of us could share. You have heard us be a witness on some level to our experiences And if you have never experienced domestic violence, um, you've heard how you can be present and supportive and and educate yourself. We hope that this episode has been a blessing um, to someone, no matter where you are on the spectrum of this. Um, We we choose to end um, and not one of our segments. We choose to end with a spiritual nugget And I'm just going to give a broad thought to ask um, both of our sisters to think whether or not they have a closing spiritual nugget they'd like to share. This is when we do our best. Um, I'm so humbled by this um, attempt to to close this out um, in the most meaningful way. But we do our best to give you a closing thought, um, to give you something that you can leave with and be encouraged by. And um, if I had to share, I would just want to say um, that help is available. Um, Support and help is available. Um, It may not feel like it. It may not look like it. um, But um, if you reach out and the first level of support that you seek does not pan out for you, don't give up. Help is available. And um, please continue to fight. You are worth fighting for. Please continue to fight. Sisters, anything come up for you? You got anything, Siobhan? No? Okay. I do have a thought. And my thought is that nothing will be wasted. Mm. Nothing. When I think about seeing my mother beat, when I think about my own experiences with intimate partner violence, you may be in the situation now and you may not be able to see how this will benefit your life or benefit someone else. But I'm here to tell you that nothing will be wasted. I have an opportunity to hold space for women who have been abused. Everything that I have gone through in my life Mm -hmm. is being used for the greater good today. I couldn't see it as a child. I couldn't see it when I was raped in college. I couldn't see it when I was raped almost seven years ago, but Mm -hmm. nothing is wasted. Nothing has been wasted. Mm -hmm. So I just want to encourage you that you are worth it. You are worth seeking support for yourself because I believe that at some point in time, what you've gone through is going to help someone else. Nothing is wasted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing is wasted. Thank you for that. I just think about um, my own life and my and those in my in my circle, um, their lives, and how it shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, it doesn't take anything away from the fact that it should not have happened. Yeah. And I wish I had control over the fact that it did, because it would not have happened. There, 
I would have found another way to learn that lesson or to, you know, to experience that and get stronger or whatever the hell, you know. Um, but because um, it happened yeah. and I couldn't control it, um, I am stronger today than I was yesterday. And I am able to be a blessing to somebody because I can share my experiences and let them know that it is possible to live through it. Um, and I know that there's some people who don't live through it. And so um, we are we are holding space for you. Absolutely. We love y'all here. Um, thank you for getting through a very rough episode with us. Um, uh, there are a million topics that we could invite Nefertiria McBride to. And so we're going to find another one <laughs> and bring her back. But it was so meaningful to have you for this one. So thank you. Thank you for being here with us for this one. Um, if you would like um, to connect with us in some way, shape, or form. Um, you want to find out more about our sister circles. If you want to attend the intensive that we talked about at the beginning of this episode, please check us out at realwomenrock.org. And then if you want to share anything related to this topic with us, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we would love to hold space for you. You can reach out to us at speakpipe.com forward slash real women, real talk, or email us at info at real women org. This has been another episode of Real Women, Real Talk. We thank you all so much for joining us and we will see you in the next episode. Take care, y'all. Be good to each other. Bye. Bye.